I would like to, in fact, let me just make sure that I got everything out this week um, in terms of all the announcements here. Yeah, we have it all out. We have it all out. Praise God. Do you reckon our church app is really cool? Uh, I reckon it's wonderful. It's just absolutely fantastic. So let's just pray right now, commit our time to the Lord as God will speak to us again through the preaching and teaching of His Word. Heavenly Father, we once again come this morning with an anticipation that you will indeed speak to us. Not only is the teaching and the preaching of your word going on, but your word is going to enter into our heart and it will do what you had intended for it to do. And right now, Father, we choose to be teachable. We are mindful, Lord, that we don't know everything. And we are mindful that even the things that we know, we need to be reminded of so we don't let them slip. And so, Lord, we make room for your word in our hearts right now. And we thank you for speaking to us in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I would like to continue on in a series of messages that we've started some weeks ago now uh, entitled Developing a Lifestyle of Faith. Developing a Lifestyle of Faith. Today is uh, the seventh message, uh, should I say the sixth message uh, in this series. Last week, of course, we had wonderful ministry for the whole weekend uh, with Pastor Tom Ingalls, who just brought an excellent word again in the area of, uh, of worship, um, of praise, of thanksgiving. And I'm going to just kind of continue on in that uh, vein, if you like, but fit that into our message on faith at the moment. Um, just a quick recap what we have said so far. We've read out of Psalm 119, verse 33, where it says, Teach me, O Lord, the lifestyle prescribed by your statutes, that I might observe it continually. Uh, and we've said that God has called us to a lifestyle of faith. Um, and um, people are saying, well, what does God need from me? Or what does God want from me? Well, God wants our heart, first and foremost. And God wants us to walk by faith. Uh, he's called us to a lifestyle of faith. And we said that the very word of God teaches us about faith. We read about the life of Jesus Christ. And that teaches us about faith. Because Jesus was and is a faith man. Uh, if we can use that expression. Then finally, uh, in the church, in the local church. We have elders. Uh, we have mature believers who have learned to walk by faith. And that's why when we get saved, God places us into a local church family. And that's where we can learn faith through the teaching and preaching of the word and through observing other people as they walk by faith. I remember when I, Vanessa and I first came into the church and just even knowing how to pray. How, how do you pray? Well, listen to uh, people, to leaders, how they pray. That's, that's how we learn how to pray. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, we might say, well, how do we conduct ourselves when things are difficult, uh, when, when challenges are going on? Well, how are the leaders dealing with challenges? So that's how we learn how to deal with challenges uh, in our lives. This morning, uh, I would like to speak to you about, uh, about Thanksgiving. Um, in fact, in Bible college, we have a whole module that's entitled Thanksgiving Praise and worship. Now, we might put everything under kind of a general cover uh, term of worship, but thanksgiving, praise, and worship are actually three uh, separate specific areas, though we can lump them together in a general sense. And I would like to read from the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and use that, if you like, as a kind of a bouncing point uh, to bounce into this message here this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. Thing. Now, let me just stop right there. It says, be anxious for nothing. Uh, if I were to ask for a, a show of hands as to how many of you are worried about things right now, uh, a few hands will go up. Some of you are, are worried about this, about that, or the other. Yet the Bible tells us, it says, do not worry about anything. All right, now, of course, that one verse of Scripture here, we could bounce over into Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus taught on the Beatitudes, and he, he told us not to take any worrisome thought for tomorrow, because tomorrow is going to take care of itself, and there's plenty of Scriptures there that tells us to not worry. All right, so it says, be anxious for nothing. By the way, this is not a suggestion. <laughs> this is actually a command. God just does not want us to worry. Christians ought to be the most carefree people 
people on the face of the earth. Yes. All right. Now, that's not to say that everything always works out extremely well for us. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be challenges that are happening. Uh, but he, God does not want us to worry. He wants us to walk by faith instead. All right. And worry and faith uh, don't work side by side. It's either the one or, or the other. So we do not worry so we can walk by faith. And when we walk by faith, we do not worry. All right. So once again, it says, uh, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now, take your pen, uh, pencil, whatever you have got, uh, and circle that word with thanksgiving. Now, it's already in bold, but we want to lift it out a little bit more out of that verse here because he says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what that means is that when we come before God uh, with faith in our hearts uh, to make requests uh, from Him, it really means that uh, in terms of, you see, faith is the assurance that our prayers are going to be answered. We're not going to try this to see, I wonder if God's going to answer my prayer. We're already approaching this whole thing with, a, with an expectation, with an assurance that God will answer our prayers. And for that, uh, there's a scripture here that has so immensely helped me uh, in my Christian walk. Uh, here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. In fact, I like quoting that scripture many times when I'm praying because it kind of helps my faith. Uh, and here is what it says. It says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have desired from him. And so what does that mean? Well, amongst other things, it means that our prayers need to be based on the word. All right. Uh, so it, first of all, it says, it says, if we ask anything. Now, anything is anything. But then it puts the qualifier in there and it narrows the field down. The anything is a universal anything. But then in the very next mouthful, it puts a qualifier on there. And it says, anything that is in accordance with God's will. So what that means in plain English, praying a prayer that is not uh, in accordance with God's will, it will not be answered. And we don't have the confidence, by the way, that it will be answered. Because somebody might say, well, where does the confidence come from? The confidence, uh, the faith, the assurance comes from reading the Word. That's where it comes from. And what happens is when we read the Word and we see a promise where God tells us that we can have something... That promise ministers faith and ministers assurance and confidence to us when we go before God to ask Him. Then we, we already know at that point that the answer is going to be yes. yes See, God's not a fickle God. God doesn't say yes, no, no, yes. God is not random. <laughs> All right. God will always do what He promised in His Word. All right. So, so that's kind of the deal. If we ask anything in accordance with his will, he hears us. So if any of you are ever wondering, it's like when you've prayed and you go away and say, I wonder if God hurt me. Well, if we prayed in accordance with God's will, he's heard us. All right. So, so it takes that kind of guesswork out of it. I wonder if God hurt me. Well, <laughs> if it's in accordance with his will, he hears us. That is a promise. That is a statement of fact. It takes all the guesswork out of it. All right? It says, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know. Circle the word know. See, faith knows. Faith is not vague and wonders if God's going to answer this prayer or not. Faith is sure. Amen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the confidence of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us. All right? So then somebody might say, well, how will you ever know God's will? I mean, God works in mysterious ways, you know. Well, it's actually quite simple. God's written word is God's will. 
and God's will is his written word. You can take those two interchangeably. God's will is his word, and God's word is his will. It works any which way. How many of you have ever worked out, and you know, math's not one of my strongest subjects, but I've worked out if I multiply something, that I, whichever number I put in the front or in the back, it doesn't matter. The outcome is always the same, all right? And, and so it is with God's will, God's word, or God's work, God's will, it is the same, all right? So in other words, uh, we go to the word, we read the promise, it ministers a confidence to us. With that confidence, we go before God and we ask God. And at that point, we already know that he will hear us and we already know that he will say yes. Amen. Because the Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Yes. All the promises, all the promises. That's another scripture. If we had more time, more space, we would have fit that in as well. People say, oh, yeah, but that's an Old Testament promise. It says all the promises. Yeah. All right. If there's a promise in the Old Testament that's there that, uh, that, uh, that does not specifically re relate to some individual that might be, you know, or, or, or say to the nation of Israel, then it relates to us too. All the promises of God are yes and amen in him. Where is that? Is that 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 3? Uh, I could be right, but I could be wrong too on that. <laughs> Praise God. You'll find it. You'll find it. Uh, and these, these scriptures, these verses, they minister tremendous confidence to us. And faith is confidence. That's what faith is. Faith is an assurance that God will answer our prayer because we have found the promise in the Word. We take that Word to God. And in fact, many times, not uncommon, uh, um, that I would go before God and I would say something like, God, you said this and this and that and that and so and so. And on the strength of your Word, I'm asking for this to happen and for that to happen because you promised. Yeah. And so it's not like I've thought of something and I wonder if, like, God's going to got that covered. Well, <laughs> if it's a need in any area, it'll be covered by some promise. God has not left any needs out. There is no, no human need that is not covered by the Word. It's all covered. All right? So, uh, we said all of that to say this, that in Philippians 4, 6, where we started out earlier on, it tells us there that in everything we should give thanks uh, to God along with our prayers. Remember, and I'm just backing up again, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. You see, our thanksgiving to God when we pray is a demonstration of our faith. Because when we pray and we ask God for something and we offer thanksgiving at the same time before we even see the manifestation of what we've prayed for, that thanksgiving is a demonstration of our faith because we know. We know that God said that we can have that. We know that God has promised us. We've asked for it. We ask for it there and then, and we offer, we offer thanksgiving there at the same time. See, conversely, a lack of thanksgiving demonstrates a lack of faith. Amen. If I pray and then go away and say, oh, I wonder if that has done any good. Well, that's a lack of faith. Because faith never wonders. Faith never like, oh, uh, has God hurt me or has God not hurt me? Do you, do you think that God wants me to have that or does not? All of these questions need to be settled before we pray. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, and so, so our thanksgiving to God is a demonstration of our faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, verse 17, verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, my message to you today, it may not be deep theology, but it's a very practical message. Anybody can do this. 
What are we supposed to do? Well, he just told us, rejoice always. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you are not rejoicing right now? <laughs> when you should, because he says rejoice always. When he says always, he means always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Now, we, we may not be literally be able to pray like 24-7, but we can certainly be in a prayerful attitude uh, all the time, all of our waking moments. And it's also good to, uh, where possible, like, you know, I've said this before, but if, if you see me drive past in, in the car when I'm going from A to B, and if there's nobody sitting in the car and my mouth is moving, it means I'm praying in tongues. Because the Bible tells us to redeem the time for the days are evil. So it's kind of doubling up, doing more than one thing at any given time. So I'm, I can pray uh, in the Spirit. I can pray. Uh, and, and so therefore, I'm able to fulfill that scripture that I, can, I pray whenever I can pray. And if I can't physically pray right now, which right now for me, I, I can't pray because I'm ministering the word to you. But I can be in a prayerful attitude. All right, so, so that's what that means here. He says, uh, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, uh, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, um, we don't give thanks to God for everything, but we give thanks to God in everything. Why don't we give thanks to God for everything? Because God is not responsible for everything that happens in our lives for everything that we are experiencing. You know, there is a devil, and sometimes the devil manages to get gets through to Christians in his attacks and in his, uh, in his uh, you know, relentless efforts to just oppress and to make people sick or to rob from them or to mess up their relationships or to mess up their marriage or whatever it is. So we don't give thanks to God for bad things because God is not at the back of the bad things that are, that we experience, but we give God, um, we give thanks to God in everything. So what that means is, uh, in every situation, give thanks to God. It means that in the good times, give thanks to God. It means in the challenging times, give thanks to God. Amen. Now personally, you know, people might, might think, and I'm assuming, um, People might think I'm a, I'm a pretty happy sort of a character. Um, personally, I don't like to give the devil the joy to see me with a sad face and to get me all down and get me all depressed. I don't like giving the devil the joy. Uh, that when something does go down that is less than ideal, that uh, the devil thinks, ha, 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 we got him this time. I just don't like to do that. Furthermore, the Bible tells me to rejoice always. So let's make an effort to rejoice always. This is just like, this is the Christian thing to do. This is the faith thing to do. You know, in the world they say that sort of separates the, 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 separates the you know, the, the, the mature ones from the, from the not mature ones. When we mature uh, in the things of God and, and in faith, we just learn to rejoice always. Come hell or high water, where everything goes wrong and we are still rejoicing. Right. Why? We have trained ourselves to do that. We, we, have, we have become doers of the word and we are now walking by faith, not by feelings. Because feelings might tell me to just get all, like, all down and all, all depressed. But we don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. James chapter 1 and these are all favorite scriptures. James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, in case some of you are unsure what, the, what trials are, what that word means, it means when there's troubles happening. That's what that means. When you fall into troubles, when troubles go on. In fact, the Amplified Translation puts it this, when you fall into various trials, tests and temptations. That's what that means. He says, count it all joy, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, this is what's happening. Uh, you see, when the devil brings trouble into our lives, um, 
And many troubles that we are experiencing, we can't even blame on the devil because we just sometimes don't make good decisions. Uh, and, 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 and people do that. Uh, they make bad decisions and they end up blaming the devil or God for their walls and their troubles. But nevertheless, right here, uh, it speaks about the fact that it says, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, the, the devil sends stuff against us. And the Bible calls this the testing of our faith. Yeah. Now, for those of you that have learned about the armor of God that is listed in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it speaks about the armor of God. It, speak, it speaks about the shield of faith. Yeah. You know, a shield is there to put a barrier between you and the enemy. That's what a shield is for. And that's what happens is that God's given us the shield of faith to put that between us and the devil so that the devil can't get through. But if I get tired or I get careless and I put my shield down and, uh, you know, trials come against me directly and kind of hit me, it means that my shield of faith is not up. So it is the t supposed to be the testing of our faith. You know, in the old days when they literally had, you know, they fought with bows and arrows and swords and spears or what have you. They had different types of, 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 uh, of shields. Um, some of them that were small, others were a little bit bigger and everything, but obviously they had to be built of a reasonably substantial material in order to withstand the blows uh, or the attacks or the, you know, the, the cuts that would come against it. And so it is with our faith. We've got to build our faith pretty strong because the devil is relentless. We don't want to give the devil any credit. But somebody said once, the devil doesn't sleep. He will try to attack 24-7. Right. <laughs> and usually around Christmas time when people go on holidays, I usually remind people, say, remember, we might go on holiday uh, from our regular work situation, but let's not go on holidays as far as faith is concerned. Let's not drop our shield of faith. Because many times the devil attacks especially hard during those periods. In fact, we know it's a known fact in society today, and, you know, it's a known fact, like in the police force, they know this, that Christmas time, holiday time, there's more trouble that goes on in people's homes uh, than what there is at regular, regular, you know, regular week during the year. So put up the shield of faith. Somebody said, what is the shield of faith? It is the solid confession of the Word of God. You confess the Word. You declare the Word. It puts up the shield of faith. You confess the word uh, regarding your salvation, and you thank God for your salvation. It puts on the helmet of salvation. Remind yourself every day that you're saved, and don't let the devil bombard your mind uh, with lies and with deception and to kind of question your salvation and to question if you're really one of God's children. If you're born again and saved, then so be it. And let's not revisit the questions. Oh, am I really saved? It's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 9 and 10, it says, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Once we believe and once we have confessed Jesus as Lord of our lives, we are saved. There is no maybe, no possibly, no, no but or anything. We are saved. The Bible says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them say so. Let them be sure about their salvation. Praise God. Awesome. Amen. Count it all joy. How many of you are joyful this morning? <laughs> count it all joy. Is everything going well? It doesn't matter. We'll still count it joy. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. We'll still count it joy. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Actually, that word patience there is not so much the word that we just wait for things. It is the word endurance. We just keep going. We just keep going. We just keep believing. We just keep, uh, we just remain in faith. You know, anybody can be joyful when things go well. Anybody. Anybody can be joyful. Wow, you know, everything is wonderful. Healthy, money in the bank, Marriage is going strong. Kids are doing what they're supposed to do. And, and all the aunties and uncles, everybody's happy. Everything is sweet. Everything is cool. The job is going great. I've got promotions happening. I'm kind of just throwing a few thoughts out there. Anybody can be happy in that situation. That's right. Anybody can rejoice. <laughs> 
but it takes a man or woman of faith to still rejoice when things are kind of all breaking loose all around us. Hallelujah. Even when the storms of life are let loose against us, and we were standing in the floods <laughs> up to our waist, and we're still rejoicing. It takes a faith person to do that. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So it says, offer your requests with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a big key. Thanksgiving is a simple key, but it's a big key. If we can learn to, to offer thanksgiving as part of just who we are and what we do, regardless of what goes on, if our thanksgiving becomes disconnected from our circumstances, then absolutely we've made a step of faith uh, and, and, and never step back again. Uh, th if thanksgiving is, is connected to our circumstances, then one day I give thanks because everything goes well. The next day I don't give thanks because things don't go well. Because the reality is we get challenging days. Thanksgiving should flow out of our lives at all times. And I'm just stating what we've already said. In Psalm 34, verse 1, the psalmist here, this is David. This is David before he came king. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall be continually in my mouth. You know, David, uh, the shepherd boy that came to visit his brothers that were in that battle, uh, in that kind of uh, lockdown with Goliath uh, being brought before the Israel army out of the, you know, out of the Philistine army. And he, David came to visit his brothers and short exchange of words, and next minute he's running down the field against Goliath and takes him down with, with a single stone. And everybody would have thought, well, I mean, he's just, he's just defeated public enemy number one. Israel's enemy number one. Uh, but it wasn't quite so. He was invited to the king's court. King Saul was the uh, king at the time. And David was kind of, um, you know, there, and he was doing different things. He was playing the harp and everything. The king was given to depression, to bouts of depression. When David played the harp, uh, depression lifted, um, which is kind of, a, a, kind of a, a whole separate teaching. We could talk about anointed music that lifts depression off of people's lives. Uh, it's just a key for somebody here that, uh, that if you are given to get down a little bit, put on some good praise and worship, it'll lift things off of your life. And have the confession of your work going and absolutely defeat that thing that's trying to, to get you down, uh, you know, kind of mentally and, and, and emotionally. Yeah. So David was there, and one day uh, um, Saul's mind went a bit squirrely, just a bit off. Uh, not only was he depressed, but he started to get very jealous, uh, and his mind just all went in all directions, and he thought that David was actually uh, his problem rather than a part of the answer. So he kept on throwing these spears at David to kill him, and, and he just had, David just had to flee from there. In the end, he just had to get away. And, 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 and Saul is pursuing uh, uh, David and trying to capture him and to kill him. I mean, how crazy is that? The man that, that defeated public enemy number one is now become public enemy number one himself. Isn't it amazing? So anyway, so David had to flee Israel, and he went to a neighboring country, uh, and he served under King Abimelech, uh, who was okay, I suppose, uh, other than the fact that he was, uh, he was an enemy of Israel. And then even under Abimelech's uh, regime there, David was accused to the king, and he had to flee from there. So he's like, you know, this guy's like, had to get away. It's like nobody liked him. It's just, <laughs> how many of you know that at that stage, uh, average joke blogs would feel a little depressed and a little rejected? And it is right at that moment that David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. He says, my thanksgiving is not connected to circumstances. My thanksgiving is connected to my heart. And I've got a grateful heart no matter what happens and no matter what goes down. You see, this is a big thing. That in terms of a grateful heart, a grateful heart is the condition of the heart. And thanksgiving is the overflow 
that flows out of a grateful heart. And your aim and my aim should be to develop a grateful heart. Just be grateful. You know, gratitude uh, is not very abundant uh, these days in society. <laughs> and just a bit later on, if we get enough time, we'll read a couple of scriptures in regards to some of the signs that will be, you know, visible in the last days. And it is ingratitude, um, just in a general sense in society today. People just no longer know how to be grateful for a lot of the little things uh, that they are experiencing. And here's the key. If we're not grateful for the little things, we cannot be grateful for the big things. Because people begin to take the big things for granted because they've forgotten about the little things. Amen. And in our nation, you know, this, uh, New Zealand is just an awesome country. And, uh, and I think things are, are generally very good. Um, you know, we talk about troubles and difficulties and what have you. Of course, there's problems. Uh, but you know what? Uh, there are countries around the world that we could travel to uh, and spend three, four weeks there and we come back and we will never have an un another ungrateful day in our nation because our nation is an awesome nation. Yeah. Yes, there are challenges and problems, but nothing to be compared with what's happening in some of the nations around the world today. So David said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall be continually in my mouth. David is rejected now. He's fleeing from the second king, got nowhere to go. He ended up in the cave, um, and he's still giving thanks. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, that is, just, uh, that is just, that is an amazing display of faith before the Lord here. In Psalm 45, verse 1, the psalmist there, he says, My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my compos composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So in other words, uh, our tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. And the question is, what do we write when things are not good? <laughs> if somebody were to read on the pages, as it were, they're not physical pages, obviously, because you, you write with literal pens on a physical page. But with our tongue being like, like the pen of a ready writer, that we write things into the atmosphere... What are we writing into the atmosphere? And atmospheres are big. Like, you know, in some places, like, uh, it's, it's a great atmosphere. And in other places, like, ooh. You know, we can't always explain, but somebody has written something into this atmosphere that is not good. You get into some homes, and there's no joy there. There's no gratitude there. There's the atmosphere has all been messed up, and it's all un invisible things, but yet we can feel it, we can discern it, that somebody, and possibly more than one, has been filling the atmosphere with the wrong kind of writing. Uh, and it's typically ingratitude, taking things for granted. People think that everybody owes them a living. So, thanksgiving is the overflow that pours forth from a grateful heart. Let's, let's give more thanks. Yeah. Let's develop our, our heart to such an extent that we give thanks regardless. In the good days and the challenging days, we just give thanks all the time. Right. Psalm 100 verse 4, kind of uh, just moving along, moving through some scriptures here that kind of, uh, really that's where the message comes from. I kind of didn't think this up and try to find a few scriptures that will fit what I thought up. It's, it's all from the, 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 whole, the message, the word, you know, it's the, the word is the starting point of this message here. God wants us to be grateful and thankful people. And if somebody doesn't have a grateful heart, they can't do much th thanksgiving either because it's the thanksgiving that's the overflow out of the grateful heart. 
Psalm 100 verse 4, enter God's gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, be thankful to him and bless his name. I always know when I get around faith people because there's a lot of thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth to die on the cross. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you, Lord, for filling me with your spirit. Thank you, Father, for forgiving all of my sins. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me abundantly. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my children. Thank you, Father, for my job. Thank you for my, for my roof over my head. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You always know when you get around faith people because there's a lot of thank you going on. You know, the practice of thanksgiving to God moves us into the presence of God. There's a whole journey there to move into the presence of God and thanksgiving moves us in there. The more thanks we give to God, the more we will experience God's presence. That's right. And we need the presence of God. Amen. All right, we got, we got stuff going on in the, in the world today. We need the presence of God. I mean, stuff is like, uh, stuff's like just flying loose in all directions in terms of wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, just everything that Jesus pro uh, prophesied about in Matthew chap chapter 24. It's all happening right now because we are in the last days. We need the presence of God. Yes, amen. And one of those ways and one key, one main way to get it is to be thankful people and to express our thanks to God at all times. Thank you, Father. The days may be challenging, but we thank you, Lord God, that, right. that uh, you're protecting us. We thank you, Lord God, that the economy might, there might be difficulties, but thank you, Lord, that you're providing all of our needs. Thank you, Lord God, that there's all sorts of viruses and diseases around, but we thank you, Lord God, that no evil befalls us and no plague comes near our dwelling. That Psalm 91 is absolutely operational in our lives. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, so... Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Let the peace of God rule in our hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's kind of <laughs> Paul, Paul writing here to kind of, it's almost like, uh, it's not as much an afterthought. He says, let the peace of God rule in, in your hearts. And, 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 and by the way, he says, you've been called to the peace of God. So, so you're called to it. And, and, and by the way, he says, be thankful. Yeah. Be thankful. That's right. So it's not an afterthought, but it's another reminder. In order to experience the peace of God, we need to be thankful people. Amen. All right, these two are kind of connected together here. He says, let the peace of God rule in our heart. You know, evidently we can choose what rules in our heart. Evidently. If that were not possible, he's telling us something that's impossible for us to do, then that will kind of, that will kind of just put us in a very bad situation. And you know, God never asks us to do anything that we cannot do. Right. We can choose what rules in our heart. Sometimes people let anger or resentment or, or hatred or something rule in their heart, and that's a choice. Amen. And we make the choice either by, by kind of neglect, but just letting things run their course, or we make the choice by developing a grateful heart right. and by becoming thankful people Amen. no matter what. No matter what. I think all of us know people or know of people. And uh, in fact, there's one distinct example here. A friend of mine from multiplied years ago now, he's the most positive guy to be around. He's thankful uh, and... and <laughs> I remember distinctly, we were a group of ministers, he's a minister uh, back then, and we got together and we played cards, and he won in the card, and he's thanking Jesus that he won in the cards, uh, card game. It's just a, a great guy to be around, positive, up, uplifting, and, and, and it, it was just awesome, but suddenly something changed. We were driving in the car, and 
somebody cut us off and he's like into it. It's like, what's happened? I, 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 th- I thought there was the, the love of God ruling in that man's heart. I thought there was, you know, great gratitude. There, and there was, but something happened. There was a neglect that took place. And if we are neglecting, looking after our heart, suddenly something different begins to rule and take us in a completely different direction. Friends, life is a lot easier when we're thankful people, let me tell you that. Amen. Life's a lot easier. Life tends to work out well simply on the, on the key uh, of thanksgiving because somehow, that's not to say that challenges can't happen, but somehow we come out on top. But somehow we come through whatever we're going through right now and somehow we're coming out the other side because we are thankful people. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not give, uh, cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So our prayers ought to be interspersed with lots of thanksgiving. Paul says, I don't cease. I, don't, I, I, I pray for you guys all the time and, and I offer thanks for you all the time. And let, let's never take our friends for granted. Let's be thankful for our friends. Right. Let's never take our spouse for granted. Let's be thankful for our spouse. Right. Let's be thankful that we live in New Zealand where we can, as a local church, gather openly and we don't have to be afraid of the authorities that they're going to come and arrest somebody and take us away. Let's be thankful. That's right. Amen. Let's be thankful. Hallelujah. What a great country we live in. So Paul never stopped giving thanks uh, for these people here. And he'd obviously developed the key of thanksgiving. As I said, it's not a deep theology key, but it's a very practical one that everybody can employ and apply immediately and immediately improve their lives. Very quickly, a couple of scriptures here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Now, we've already said before that we are in the last days. All the signs, all the pro- prophecies that have been prophesied about, or should, should I say a lot of the prophecies that have, been, have already been fulfilled, it kind of locates us as the last generation before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the last days. He says, perilous times will come. You know, we tend to interpret the world based on our own experience and the country that we live in. But you know, there's people right now that, have, that are, suffer, are suffering starvation. People right now that are kind of, that can't trust the authorities because the authorities right down from the king, from the despot leader, all through the judicial system, the police force, the army, everybody's corrupt uh, because that's what's been allowed into that country. Praise God that we can move around freely and, uh, and that we live in a democracy, that we've got freedom of speech, we can say things, uh, that, uh, that where we can disagree with other people, we're not going to get locked up because of it. Praise God for all of that. Amen. So as perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, Unthankful, and here it is, unthankful. People will be unthankful. It goes on to talk about unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away. I don't know if you ever do this. (laughs) Sorry, I'm just, don't know why I thought of... uh, imitating this, this guy that had that funny accent. But anyway, sometimes, I don't know if you do this, but when I read the Bible, I sometimes ask myself the question, am I in there somewhere? That's a bit of a scary thought. Am I unthankful? Am I unloving? Amen. Jesus says anybody can love people that love us, but what about the unlovely? That's a bit of a strong thought, isn't it? <laughs> am I without self-control or am I exercising self-control? Am I a lover of money? 
am I in there anywhere? That's a bit scary. I'm going to move right along right now. I'll just, bump link will just move right on. But let me tell you, and this is the one point that I wanted to make from this passage here is that one of the signs of the last days is that people will be and are unthankful. Yeah. Just right. Parents, teach your children yeah. to say thank you. Yeah. Don't let them run loose and help themselves to anything, including things that are in the fridge. <laughs> Whilst you don't want to withhold anything from your children, but children should learn to ask, not that you would say no, but it's just the right thing to do to bring children up in a way that they're not running loose and then you get in their way and they're going to kick you over or something. Um, teaching children to be thankful. Teaching children that, that it's good to ask for things rather than assume that we can automatically, you know, grab this and grab that. That's mine, you know, like, phew, you know, like, you know, then, and then if, if kids are not trained into that, then you get adults that are 30, 40, 50 years old and say, this is mine. Here, get out of my way. <laughs> are we still doing all right this morning? <laughs> Let's teach our children to be grateful, learn to ask for things, and when they're given something, to say, thank you. 1 Timothy 4, and we'll close with this scripture very shortly. Verse 1, the Spirit um, expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Now, the latter times, the last times, the last days, end times, it's all referenced to the same period. We're in that period right now. Some will depart from the faith, uh, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, uh, speaking lies and hypo hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. By those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. And of course there's a lot of stuff in there and we haven't got time to get into every specific uh, facet of the truth right here. But one point uh, I would like to make from that is that mealtimes is a great opportunity to give thanks, to train ourselves that at least three times a day, if we eat three, three meals, that at least three times a day we say, thank you, Father, right. for providing this food for us. Uh, sometimes they, we say, give thanks, you know, say grace. Uh, let's just pour out our gratitude before the Lord each time when we open up our mouth and not automatically assume that, uh, that you know, that provision is always going to be there because, as I say, we live in a great country. We've got a, a wonderfully prosperous uh, uh, situation in this nation. It's all around us. Let's be grateful and let's fight to keep it that way and let's encourage other people to become thankful as well. New Zealand and the nations around the world will be better nations if people are more grateful and offer more things to God. So let, let me say, close with this thought, let thanksgiving be alongside our prayer, our faith all the time and our faith will be stronger and we will be stronger people for it in Jesus' name. Amen.